Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Praise God. Let's go ahead and get our Bibles out and let us run over to uh, the Isaiah, the ninth chapter. We're talking about authority. We, we kind of, um, we haven't digressed in our subject. We just kind of were more extemporaneous and in, in, in where God was leading us to do certain things. Um, in certain ways, in ministry the past couple of weeks, we hadn't stayed quite on Scripture, but we stayed on point. And good to have the gills back. It would have been better if I'd gone in their place, but we're glad to have them back. Hallelujah. They, they, uh, they went off on a five-day Western Caribbean cruise. Yeah. Eating all that good food, taking up. Uh, Melanie, where's all that hair? <laughs> we thought Je what happened to Melanie Jeff left her somewhere and picked up somebody else pictures came in Melanie had all this hair I think, look at there who's that woman with Jeff I'm calling Pastor Hagen tomorrow we've got, we got a problem with one of our Raymond students graduates and uh, yeah, yeah look at this how do they, we're talking about Jesus came. Why did Jesus came? Jesus came to get what? Get back the authority that man had lost. And so uh, we talked about that last week. And we shared that. You listened to last week's message. If um, That was on there. We got last week recorded, didn't we? All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, Jesus came to get back what man had lost. And, uh, you know, he went and stripped Satan of his authority to recover it for mankind. Let's look at Matthew, uh, Isaiah 9 and see how the, what the Bible says this. Remember, um, there is prophecy concerning Jesus' coming and the purpose of his coming. Okay? Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What's the, now, I've heard people disagree with this, but I believe this is talking about the, the, the two aspects of Jesus. The child is born is his humanity. The son is given is his, his, his deity. His humanity is born. That was his flesh. His son that was given was the, the, the incarnate son who existed with the father before all time. Hallelujah. And the, gov the government shall be upon his shoulder. So authority. He's coming. Now listen. Now this is not talking about. Notice this is not talking about he has it now. At the time this was written. Because man had lost it. But he said, there's a son that's going to be given. There's a, there's a child that's going to be born. There's a son that's going to be given. And the government's going to be on his shoulders. Now how? Because he's going to come to get it. Yeah. I mean, kind of like that song. Ah, get ready. Get ready. Look out, devil, because here he comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get ready, because Jesus is on coming. Hallelujah. Da -da -da -da. Beep, beep. Anyway. Of the increase of his, oh, I'm sorry, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. No, that's in there, why? Because he's equal with the Father. He is, he and his Father were one. Amen? Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the, his, the, the, his uh, uh, and upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So here we have a prophecy of the coming Messiah, and he's coming to get the government. He's coming to get the authority. Amen? And then there'll be no end to it. Once Jesus gets it back, it'll never be lost again. Glory. Glory. See, when man was given that authority, man lost it. Jesus came to get it back. But he came to get it back so that it could never be lost again. How? Because he's you know, the, the, the covenant between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, what is it? We, don't, we do not singularly go and possess the authority. We possess the authority through Jesus. He still re retains 
hold on it. He's the head, we're the body. Okay, it rests on him. We access it, and we'll talk about that through, through different ad- means and venues uh, to operate in it, but he still possesses it. Amen. Hallelujah. Look with me, if you will, um, oh, back over into Isaiah 6. That's not the right place. I just went to the wrong dog on it. Oh, well. That's okay. I was just going to throw another scripture in there that wasn't worth in my notes. Um, look at Daniel chapter, thank you, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. See, these, we got prophecies concerning Jesus. Come on, Bible. I have to say one of the drawbacks of using electronic Bibles all the time is your Bible pages don't get torn, turned as much. Daniel 7, verse 14. We'll look down, through, down there near verse 14. We'll bring back up verse 13. And I saw night visions. And behold, one light, the Son of Man, came with clouds of heaven, and they came to the, and, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before. And there was given unto him, who? The Son of Man. Who is Jesus called in the New Testament? The Son of Man. He's called the Son of God, the Son of Man. Both. Because there's, there's references to his deity and references to his humanity. Okay? And he said, and there was given unto him, who? The Son of Man. What? Dominion and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting, what? Dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Now, Daniel, seeing this by prophecy, seeing this by vision, but it, it, is, it is prophetic. I believe in, you know, listen, a lot of the stuff that we get that people have about prophecy now, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, there were some, some people prophesying a couple of years ago. One guy prophesied that basically, he didn't use his name, but he, when you, you listen to how he described it, that Donald Trump was going to win the presidency, and nobody believed him. I didn't, I was kind of like, you're right. Hello? When, when, when people speak by the unction of the Holy Ghost, it's not always going to be the hunky-dory, makes sense thing. Now, we love personal prophecies in some of these meetings where everybody gets the, gets the, the who, whoo! word you know oh you're you're the you're the best thing since peanut butter and sliced bread people love you we don't like the things where the prophet takes the girdle and binds the man's hands and so shall he who wears uh, he who wears this girdle be when he goes to jerusalem Remember, I believe Agabus came down and bound Paul's hands and said that to him. And, you know, there was no shout for joy over that one. Hello? Are y'all here? I mean, Paul got so serious about it, he got one place with, with, uh, near Ephesus where he called the leaders of Ephesus and said, you won't ever see me again. I'm going to Jerusalem. All right, that's why I've been prophesied. I'm going to be bound. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, love, we love that glory stuff. Woo! You're, you're, you're facing a difficult time, and it's, it's not over yet. But on the, on the other side, you'll come out. Well, we can, we can hold on to the other side, come out. We don't want to deal with it. Uh, I, bind, I bind that going through the rough place stuff in Jesus' name. I bind the devil. I don't receive that. He's a false prophet. Next thing you know, you're right smack dab in the middle of it. Now, Brother Hagin said back in 19, um, remember the recession of the, of the 70s? You know, gas lines? had to fly a flag, green flag one day and a white flag the other day. You filled up your car based on the, uh, the ending number of your license tag, uh, whether it was odd or even. You know, and some place only let you get $2 worth of gas. You had to drive off. That's all you could get. And, of course, it was 39 cents a gallon. But that was like a, like a double increase in what you were paying. And then it got up to 49, 59 cents. People were, like, going crazy over 59 cents gas, gas ceiling. And all we can think is where uh, those, yeah, those were the days, my friend. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Now you can fill up, I mean, you can go in there and fill up for a dollar and get three gallons. Yeah. Anyway. Hallelujah. How did I get off and on? Uh, recession. Oh. 
See, we, we, don't, we don't like them tough times. You know? But Brother Hagin, the Lord spoke to him and said, go, go lay off all your staff except for two people before it all happened. And you know what? They didn't go under. A lot of ministries went under because they didn't have any money. They had all this staff and they got caught, uh, caught later and it was too late to do anything about it. Couldn't get it turned around and they were done. So go lay off all your staff. Keep, keep this one and keep that one. That's it. And they made it. And of course they hired people back when, they got, when things turned around. But you know, look, God, God had to keep the ministry going. He had to reach people. Amen? Where's your faith? If you've got enough faith, you'll be able to see it even in famine. Not if the Holy Ghost leads you to do something different. Hello? Gideon had uh, 30,000 people show up to go to battle. And the Lord told him to get rid of a bunch of them. First thing they did, they got rid of about 27,000. Then they got rid of 2,700 more. Ended up with 300. Well, well, praise God, look what the Lord, he provided us all these soldiers. We're going to win. We're back, we're back to on Wednesday night teaching. You got to be, being led by the Spirit has everything to do with your walk of faith. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Jehoshaphat, they, they came around them on the cliff of Ziz, and they were all around him, and all the people came, what are we going to do? And they began to cry unto the Lord, and the Lord said, do this. Tomorrow you will not need to go out and fight the battle. And everybody tries to use that word for every battle they face. It was a word to Jehoshaphat at that time on what to do. Everybody else tries to run out there. We'll get the praisers out and run them out front. You're going to get them killed unless the Holy Ghost told you to do it that way. See, we picked the wrong part of the story to emphasize. We emphasize the praisers win the battles. No, being led by the Holy Ghost wins the battles. That's the part we're supposed to emphasize. Amen. Amen. Not, the, not the praisers got it done. Oh, we need a great praise team. Well, I love good praise things. I love, you know, good worship. You know, that's, that we need to have that. That's awesome. But we don't take that and interject into them a narrative from the Bible that was not the narrative God was trying to get across to us. Gather them all together. Send the praisers out. You'll not need to fight this battle. There's other battles they had to fight. But that battle, God said, I'm going to do it a different way. And so they went out and they began to sing, Praise ye the Lord for his mercy endureth forever and ever. Don Francisco did that song, remember that? Love. We'll never end. All right, hallelujah. Jump at Jehoshaphat, Hallelujah. How do I recover from this stuff? Anyway, and the Lord sent ambushments against them, and they started killing each other off. That's not, that's not how it happened all the time. There's times they had to go in ahead and fight them. As a matter of fact, there are times they had to go out there and fight, and fight all day long, and had to go out there and hold um, uh, Moses' arms up, you know, because, I mean, uh, because jo you know, uh, Josh Joshua. Joshua's arms up. Because the battle, the, the, the moon was standing still, the sun was standing still, and they, went, they, they were going to fight until they won the battle, and it was gonna, you know, going down in the sun, and they stopped until they won the battle. But they're, they're out there fighting. The praise team went out there. What did we do? It is the narrative that we're supposed to pick up that when we follow the leading of the Spirit in our walk of faith, we win. And it might be this way this time. It might be the praisers this time. It might be actually going out and fighting the battle the next time. It might be like Dad Hagen said, you know, he used to be able to just confess he was healed. And one time he couldn't get healed that way. And the Lord said, lay your hands on yourself. And he laid his hands on himself and he got healed. Amen. And that's a longer story than that. But, that's, you know, it was the direction of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. And, um. But notice this kingdom is going to be a, a, a what? He's going to have dominion. He's going to have the glory and the kingdom of dominion. And that dominion will never end. This is everlasting. Jesus came to get it all back. It's not going to ever come to an end. Jesus won't lose it. Say, can somebody say, glory to God, Jesus won't lose it. Hallelujah. Um, look over in John chapter 17. I keep looking for a clock back there and there's not one. There's a nail for one. We need to bring one and stick up there. 
John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life unto as many as thou hast given him. Hallelujah. Now here we have it. We have Jesus trying to get power, glory to God. I mean, not, not, um, not get power, but he has come and said, Now, Father, it's time for you to glorify me. It is time for you to let that power be manifest. What, what power are we talking about? He's coming to the end of his earthly ministry. He is going to now receive the authority. And listen, we, we understand he's not just going to receive the authority because he, he showed up. He's going to have to go get it. This whole thing is being brought to a culmination of him walking in there and getting it. He's going to get it. He's going to strip Satan of his authority. Well, actually, the man's authority that he, he, he in a... Um, Legally, he possesses, but not morally. He didn't have the moral right to it. He had the legal right, but not the moral right to it. He had it because he tricked Adam and Eve into giving it to him or subdued them through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They yielded to that and gave it to him. And he took that authority. Jesus has come down and said, now glorify me with the, with the power. I'm, I, I'm going to get it. That's what I'm here for. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians... 15. Now, we talked about last week how that Jesus uh, paid the price. Jesus went and uh, uh, suffered for man's sin. Satan illegally captured him. Satan illegally had him bound because he had, what? Who himself, he had no sin. Jesus never committed sin. At the cross, he allowed sin to overtake him, but he never committed sin. He never displeased the Father. He never disobeyed. And when he opened himself up for sin to overtake him and Satan to take authority over him, Satan didn't have a right to it. He had no right to do that. But Jesus let him do it. That way a righteous man was able to pay the penalty for sinful man. And once heavens, and it didn't take a lot, less than three days, Father said, that's enough. You're my son. I'm your father. Angels worship him. Why? Because they saw him made sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. They're, they're messed up. The angels are running around messed up, man. You know, they're sitting over in the corner going, man, this is messed up. I mean, we saw him all through eternity sitting here by the, by the Father. We saw him go down to the earth, walk around down there. They couldn't do anything to him. And now all of a sudden, Satan has control over him. This is messed up. And then the father said, I'm his father, and he's my son. And he comes up, and the, the angels, are still, they're still going around. I still don't know what's going on. Worship him! <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> right on. We saw what happened last time that my, our, our co com compadres did not do what you told them to do. They're over there. <laughs> it's not working out real good for them. I'm not, I, yes, sir. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. All right. Jesus comes back with that authority. Let me say this. He didn't get it so he could run up to heaven and hold on to it. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15. For he hath put all things under his feet. Um, but when he saith all things he are put under him, it is uh, manifest that he is accepted, which did put things all under him. And when all things, that's being the Father's not under the, under the feet of Jesus. The Father's not under the authority of Jesus. Can I, can I just kind of make that easier to understand from King Jimmy? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, that is, unto Jesus, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that, that put all things under him. That the Son shall be subject unto the one who put all things under the Son. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That God may be all in all. Now, the Holy Spirit honors the Son. The Son honors the Father. It is the, it is the Trinity. It is the Godhead. How do you figure that out? When we all get to heaven... We'll get to see some stuff we never understood. <laughs> when we all see the Trinity, we'll go, wow, that's really pretty doggone good. I mean, you know, we'll just kind of be going, you know, I mean, really, folks, I mean, we've had, everybody uses the egg. They use this. They use that. They try to explain the Trinity. It is such a spiritual thing that we can't understand with the carnal mind. And even in, with a spiritual mind, we kind of go, I take that one by faith. 
The Bible says it's there. He's called the Godhead. I mean, the Bible makes reference to the Trinity and makes it that it, the Father, Son, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are God. But it, because you, you, we study the Holy Spirit, there are works attributed to the Father in the Old Testament that are attributed to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. There's acts attributed to the Son that are attributed to the Father in other places. So we have to understand God is, in, 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 the Trinity is a unique spiritual thing that we probably won't really fully understand until we see it in heaven. And so we take, there are things we just take by faith. The Bible says it, I take it by faith. Do I fully understand it? No. Well, if you don't understand it, not everything is to be understood. Even in science. Even in science you? You're not going to understand everything. We can talk about how gravity works. How many really understand gravity? Well, the earth is spinning. Why is the earth spinning so it keeps us down on here? How does that work? Because the earth spins, it pulls. How does that work? Why does spinning make it work? It's physics. Yeah? Okay, why? Yeah, there you go. Where does physics come from? The brown cow. Ephesians 1. Hallelujah. It's not after 12. My watch isn't right. My iPhone lies to me. Anyway. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. We're back at verse 19. Ah, oh, let's read this whole prayer. This is a great prayer. I can tell you, you can pray this over yourself. You can pray it over people. You can make it first person or, 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 or second person or third person, depending on what you need to do. I am telling you, this is an amazing prayer. Hallelujah. Wherefore, when I heard of your faith, verse, faith, verse 15, in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's how Paul prayed for people. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, who, toward, to us who, are, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand. Think about that. He's praying that God will work the power in you that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Oh, wow. Woo, that took some power. I said, that took power. That took a heavenly power to raise Christ up from the dead. And Paul's praying that same power works in us. Oh, hallelujah. The glory of that power at work in us. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Praise God. Re what? Resurrection life. Resurrection power. Lifting us up over the circumstances of life. Lifting us up over the temptations of life. Lifting us up over the power of the enemy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That resurrection power. That resurrection life. Working in us. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's what Paul's praying for the church. He's not praying you bozos get your act together. Or we're going to knock you upside the head. When he raised him up from the dead, set him in his own right hand in heavenly places, where? Far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head. Jesus is the head over all things. But then it says this, to the church, which is what? His body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. All that dominion and all that authority was granted into Jesus when he defeated the enemy and took man's crown of glory and took man's authority back from Satan. It was granted into Jesus. And he was raised up and seated above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Oh, thank God, every name that is named. Hallelujah. And gave and de decreed him as the head over all things to the church. Jesus got it. He bears the crown of the authority, but it's vested in his body, the church, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He wears the crown of authority as the head. The church exercises the authority as his body in the earth. Hallelujah. 
I said, hallelujah. That's shouting grounds. Ha hallelujah. Hey, you can hoop over that glory to God. Well, I thank you for one, a couple of grunts and amen and a couple of three smiles. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's move to the next one. Philippians 2, which ties is the new term segues. Right into this last scripture. We, now, if you're older, we would say this ties right in. All the new generation says segways. What does that mean? Well, I don't, I don't think it's that little cart thing you ride around on. What is that thing called? Segway, okay. When, so when the first time I heard somebody use segway, I thought, you're riding a cart around? No, it ties together. Okay, well, this segways are ties together. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 2. There's another prayer in Philippians. It's a good prayer. This is Philippians 1, nine, And this I pray, that your love may yet abound more and more in the knowledge and all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Man, that's a, those are awesome prayers, aren't they? That's what Paul's praying. He's praying this kind of stuff over the church. He'll rebuke in one minute and then pray over them the next. Straighten up, bone heads. I'm praying for you. Amen. Why? He's letting them know they gotta, they're, they're going to need to change, but he doesn't leave them with just the, the terminology uh, they've got to change. He's praying for them for the change to take place. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father wherever he lives to make intercession for you. He's praying for you all the time. If ain't nobody else pray, uh, can you hear him? Look at me real quick. If ain't nobody else praying for you, Jesus is. Hallelujah. You might think you're all alone, all by myself. But Jesus is the friend that sits closer than a brother. He will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. And he lives. If I said he ever lives, I mean his, 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 his existence is to pray for you. Glory to God. Well, I feel pretty boneheaded. That's okay. He's praying for you. Amen? Let's jump over to the next chapter, which is where we were heading. And um, verse 5. We, we really need to kind of wrap right here this morning because we're going to receive communion today. Hallelujah. Let this mind be in you. Attitude. Which also was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God... Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. One translation says he stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory. Okay? He made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, what was it about his being in the likeness of men that was not the same as men? He knew no sin. He is referred to as the second or last Adam. And so he embodied what Adam embodied in original creation. There was no sin. Everybody else had sin in them. Everybody else was subordinate to Satan's authority because of the sin. But Jesus came and stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory. Why? Because if he walked as God and did what he did as God, man couldn't do it. He had to fulfill the, the plan of the Father from original creation by walking out the Father's plan for a, a human in flesh, a spirit in flesh, to obey God, to honor God, to please God, to overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and defeat Satan, which he did at every turn. Why? So that the church could do the same. You must be born again. Once again, have life come into flesh. The life of God in human flesh and exercise dominion and authority over Satan in the earth. Been lost since the garden. Hello? There were, there were, there were glimpses of that authority being exercised throughout, throughout history. And when, when certain men would, would obey God and, and God would do certain things, but it was just never, it was never a consistent 
theme where Satan was defeated. And it was always, it was always in a covenant thing where they, you know, it was still limited. They couldn't get out. They still couldn't get out of that dominion. But when Jesus came and broke the authority of that dominion, man could get out. It's like a few years ago. I guess it's about it's been about ten years ago now. Um, somebody at Microsoft was doing some work, and in, 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 in the background, they accidentally accidentally left a portal open. And within just a few hours, the entire world got into Microsoft infrastructure and, and shut it down. I mean, they absolutely corrupted it. it. Took them, what, three days to a week, Bill, to recover. Microsoft was shut down for at least three days because the Borg entered in. That hole got open, and, and hackers from all over the world got in there and just started tearing down all the pieces. They had to shut it down. They had to go back and get backups. They had to restore everything with a backup, and then they had to fix all the stuff that got messed up. It was a mess. And see, we did this in reverse. Jesus came in. He got taken to hell by the devil. He overcame. He defeated him, and he opened up the portal, and now anybody that believes can slip right out and mess up all of his stuff. And Microsoft is the devil. So anyway, <laughs> isn't that right, Brother Bill? It's the evil empire. Bill Gates is Darth, he's not even Darth Vader. He's the emperor. Now, I'm saying this as a joke, guys. I'm just being silly. Just, just don't, don't, I don't want any lawsuits. I'm being silly. Okay? Hallelujah. I use the Microsoft world. Because Apple's the antichrist. Anyway. And I guess Linux is the beast. Anyway, but look here. Being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient even unto the death of the cross. Wherefore? Because he did everything, he obeyed God, he paid the price for man's sins, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. And here, we're going to get into this next week, getting, we're going to get into the name of Jesus. Here is where the church exercises the authority. God hath highly exalted him and given unto him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Now, this is the King James uses the italicized of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things beneath the earth. The word of things is not in the Greek. Every knee should bow of heaven, of earth, amen, and under earth. It's not talking about things, it's talking about beings. It's talking about spiritual powers, principalities, mights, dominions, rulers of the darkness of this world. And every knee shall bow of beings in heaven, of beings in earth, and beings beneath the earth. Amen? And should what? And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Woo! Jesus came, he defeated, and when he came up, God exalted him and gave him a name. But he gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. Now the use of the name is how we access the crown of authority that the head wears. And we begin to speak things in the name of Jesus. We begin to take authority in the name of Jesus. Amen? Now again, there are, there are parameters to that. Number one, the Bible has to promise it. Amen? You can't be resisted by people. I don't want your Jesus. You can't make them get saved. Well, there's still human spirits who have a right. Amen? Praise the Lord. Did y'all get blessed out of this? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.